much. First thing first is this thing working. Working, can everyone hear me? Great. I wasn't sure how to interpret redeeming the dead, so I went for a very literal interpretation, which is how to physically bring the dead back. How to bring my ancestor back. This is my family tree, starting with my daughter. Then uh, there is I, mother, grandfathers. We come to Eduardo Scarpetta, who was born in 1854, or maybe he wasn't born in 1854 because biographies are not clear. In his own autobiography, once he says 154, once he says 53. So we don't know when Eduardo was born, and I, didn't and I don't even know 100% sure that he was my ancestor. You know, the family names are different. You see, Wikipedia says he was, and uh, most books say he was. So I do consider him as uh, my ancestor. He died in 1925. He was an actor, a playwright, a businessman, a theater owner, a, a uh, director, a producer. He was one of those people who do everything on the stage. And in fact, his autobiography is called 50 Years on the Stage. In fact, his autobiography is a mind file. Is everyone familiar here with the concept of mind file? I see that most people are. Uh, Bill Bambridge and Martin Rothblatt use uh, this term a lot. It means you know, a whole uh, database of everything about a person. Uh, biography and pictures and films and things. Every record that exists about one person. Uh, well, a book, an autobiography, is certainly a mind file, but I don't uh, really think uh, is a complete one. How can you encapsulate a life in a book that thick? You, don't, you really can't. Also, as uh, most people would uh, tend to say only the good things and don't, not say the bad things. In fact, uh, if you read Eduardo's autobiography, you think he was a very nice person. If you read other books that have been written about him, then you start thinking, well, you know, a uh, nice person, but. <laughs> okay, let's <laughs> leave it at that. I don't uh, think uh, the mind file approach is sufficient to reconstruct uh, and uh, resurrect a person. I had frequent discussion with Bill and Martin. They think it can. I don't think it can, but anyway. Uh, I'm going to talk about technological resurrection how to bring someone back from the past. The concept that I sometimes refer to as copying to the future is to use some form of weird uh, technology based on super science, able to go back in time and make a copy of uh, whatever is in the mind of a person uh, before that, and then re-instantiate uh, the copy in the present, and that's it, you have resurrected the person. Sometimes you can complete a mind file with the data that exists, but sometimes the data don't exist anymore in the present. For example, this uh, is uh, Eduardo's uh, theater in Napoli, Italy, but uh, it's only an old picture because the theater doesn't exist anymore. The idea is let's find a way to go back in time and get the information we need to resurrect our dead. This is technological resurrection. And I have written an, ant an entire book about that, where I explore the physics that could be uh, the foundation of the technology of resurrection. I have many different scenarios, many different theories, many different possible ways of doing things. Mm. Which is the right one? We don't know yet. We don't know enough science yet. Mm. By the way, that's only promotional here. I do recommend everyone that you read my book. Okay, <laughs> let's forget about my book. What I can say about technological resurrection is that uh, it's not going to happen in, uh, it's not going to happen next week. It's not going to happen in the next decade. We are really talking of very far future magic transcendent ultra technology. Only the kind of beings that can create 
and uh, destroy entire galaxies in the universe, I believe we'll be able to do something as uh, incredibly challenging as retrieving the death from the past. But you know, the future is long, the universe is young, this time will come. And for us, subjectively, no time will elapse. You just close your head, we just close your eyes and uh, wake up sometime. We need physical models, we need, we don't know enough science yet. So we need to think in terms of the science that I do understand. So I want to make an analogy here. This is uh, considered as uh, the oldest novel that uh, belongs to the journal that we call science fiction now. It's about a trip to the moon. It was written in the 1600s. The technology that was used to reach the moon was to go to the moon uh, uh, with uh, a bird. Uh, that, uh, who is the first one who can say why that wouldn't work? No air. Right. That's uh, one of the many reasons. There is no air in space, so that cannot be done. But it doesn't matter because there are other technologies that do enable us to reach to the moon. In view of the fact that we know how to get to the moon, I think this old science fiction book was instrumental in giving people the idea that they could eventually go to the moon and stimulate someone to think about uh, wh what eventually became the space travel technology that we have now. So simple, naive, wrong models have, I believe, a value, and it is an important one. So how to bring Eduardo back through the fourth dimension? Of course, I'm not going to read this text from Martin Gardner. I'll just notice that in the 19, at the end of the 19th century, the concept of uh, fourth dimension as phys physical uh, stage for uh, what we call paranormal now was uh, uh, very popular. People used to think that ghosts live in the fourth dimension. People used to think that a god lives in the fourth dimension. And uh, our world is the three-dimensional surface of a vast four-dimensional sea. You can imagine the fourth dimension like that. This is a giant soap bubble. There is a film, two-dimensional one, embedded in our three-dimensional space. Now make uh, a step toward one more space dimension up in your imagination. And that is, I believe, a good way to visualize a fourth dimension that can be mathematically and geometrically complex. And uh, you hear a lot of fourth dimension in modern physics, especially string theory. As a matter of fact, uh, you hear about uh, many more dimensions than four. They say uh, 10 dimension, or maybe depending on an interpretation point, is really 11 dimension. However, the concept is that our world you, me, everyone, everything, is a uh, membrane, we say uh, brain, in a higher dimensional bulk. And uh, so you have uh, our world here, and the real world of uh, leaves and uh, trees and sunshine is outside the space that we can perceive. Okay, uh, well, I hope everyone has seen Interstellar, great movie. Who hasn't seen Interstellar? Whoa, that's a good advertisement for the film. Uh, the concept of uh, traveling through the fourth dimension and even of beings that live in the fourth dimension is one of the central concepts in Interstellar. Uh, Kip Thorne, the Nobel uh, Prize of uh, 20, 2017 for the first detection of gravitational uh, waves. By the way, I believe he was uh, born here in Utah and is uh, culturally a Mormon. He was also born in the church. He describes uh, uh, the fourth dimension in the book. All the particles and all the forces and the fields known to humans are confined to our brain with one exception, uh, gravity and the warping of space-time associated with gravity. There might be other kind of matters and fields and forces 
that have four spy space dimensions and reside in the book. And this, in illustration, I have our world is here. Everything that we can see and touch and uh, perceive is here. But uh, you have other things that live outside the three-dimensional fabric of our reality. Uh, gravity is one of these things. And there might be other uh, particles that are able to freely move in the bulk. And there is this concept that uh, taking a very complicated uh, path through the four-dimensional bulk, one could uh, be able to access uh, times that from the perception of an observer living in the brain would be located in the past. Uh, I'm not going to go into any detail. There is a very good book, uh, The Perfect Wave, which explains this uh, theory, together with many scientific uh, papers, of course. I have to underline that this is a theory. It's not established uh, science. But let's use a bit of imagination here. And let's use even more imagination to imagine uh, uh, beings that live in the bulk and have uh, access to what we could only call magic and transcendent technology now. By the way, one of the people who developed the theory that I was mentioning before said that perhaps in the distant future we will evolve so that our consciousness resides in a ball of sterile neutrinos, which are hypothetical uh, particles that, uh, according to theories, would be able to access the fourth dimensional bulk. And now you can imagine that if super intelligent beings with access to ultra technology live in the bulk, they could uh, be able to engineer worlds like ours. Um, I'm going to pre-answer the question, who is this uh, woman here? Is she a god or is she a future human engineer? Uh, my answer is that uh, she could be both. And perhaps the difference is not as uh, sharp as many people think. Perhaps our descendant could become like God. Didn't anyone called Joseph Smith say something like that? Like 100 years ago, yes, he did. OK. Genesis revisited. So let's imagine a piece of magic ultra technology, something that we can move through the fourth dimension, get it very close to our three-dimensional uh, brain, and take a very high-definition picture of uh, what is on the brain. Mm. Well, uh, I think that device looks familiar. In fact, we all have that device, a similar device in our pocket. And I want to emphasize here the point that from the point of view of my ancestor, Eduardo Scarpetta, this is a magic device. This is really magic technology. You know, the whole thing you have in your pocket, you uh, look at something called the internet, whatever that is, you can use it to talk in real time with someone on the other side of the planet. Whoa, from for, Ed, for Eduardo, that's ultra tech super tech, transcendent tech. And uh, he died only in, uh, less than 100 years ago. Who can imagine what our uh, descendants will be able to do and what magic technology they might develop in uh, hundreds or uh, thousands of years? I think some brain scanner printer like this is within the realm of what is physically possible in the very interesting universe that we happen to inhabit. OK, so that how to bring Eduardo back? Well, that is simple now. I have all the elements. First, you take a picture of Eduardo on the brain. That's it. You scan the past, you make a copy of Eduardo. And you move it to another brain, or you move it to the same brain. Uh, that could be an engineered uh, brain that looks very much like our own world, perhaps with some improvements. Or you can uh, bring Eduardo directly into the bulk, into the real world that we do not perceive, the world of uh, the leaves and the clouds and the trees here. 
Now, from his point of view, it would be a very unusual environment. So I think uh, they would first uh, put him in some kind of simulated uh, virtual reality-like environment to make him feel at home. And I think uh, if they studied his life, they would put him in this home, which is the home that he built in uh, uh, Napoli. And here he had uh, written qui rido io, that in Italian means, here I am the one who laughs. After uh, spending so many years making other people laugh, he wanted a place where he could laugh himself. And I believe uh, in some uh, part of the hyper-dimensional reality that I have been uh, exploring in this short uh, uh, talk. I think uh, Eduardo is laughing and uh, smiling at us. And I hope you enjoyed my presentation and thank you very much. <laughs> Do you have uh, any time for questions or does anyone who wants to ask a question? We have a couple of minutes. Okay. What if Eduardo is doing something better than coming back to Earth and he does not want to come back? Well, uh, thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, I can give two different answers. One is that uh, if you read his biography, unfortunately he's only available in Italian, you see that he was someone who loved life. And I think that is an answer in itself. Why would he want to come back? Uh, instead of not coming back. I think because he loved life. And I hope uh, everyone here can be the same thing. Now, coming to the second part of your question, what if he is doing something that is so much better than coming back to a place like this? Well, who said that uh, there must be only one of Eduardo? He was an actor. He played, lot, uh, he, he played lots of of different uh, characters. And I think I'm not an actor myself, but I believe when you are an actor and uh, you play a character, you really become your character. So there has not been only one Eduardo Scarpetta. There have been many of them. And uh, what's wrong with one more? Two different Eduardos could be doing two different things at the same uh, uh, moment. Don't forget that. Uh, uh, Time is a concept much more complex than we usually think. So that uh, I think one of him would want to come back. Yeah, I have a question. Um, what's the impetus for them to, or these, these supposed future creatures to go and bring him back? If they're free from being embedded in sort of linear time that we exist, uh, there already is an Eduardo who who's always there. So what would be the point of duplicating him? That's a very good point. And my answer would be that uh, the permanent version of Eduardo that according to any block universe like a theories uh, does exist in space time is not necessarily a version that could uh, experience uh, that could have subjective experiences. It's more like uh, a page on a book. Now, if someone is motivated to bring Eduardo uh, back in a format that is able to think and feel, then I think they would not leave him as only a page of a book, but bring him back to reality in a more experience and experiencing and interacting way. Does that answer your point? Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Chris.